please always reach out and ask what could a career look like for you at Everyday Independence because employee journeys are just as unique as participant journeys. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. I've got an incredible panel, but I'm going to start the session for about the first 15 or 20 minutes. We'll then introduce you to our panel and you'll get to see some real life careers that have come to life at Everyday Independence. So Cherie, to the next slide. And before going any further, I would like to, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and our site is held. We pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the first people of Australia. I'd also like to talk about our why. As soon as we've done our acknowledgement to country, at Everyday Independence, we always state our why. This is what unites us as an organisation, and this is what brings us together as change makers that are going out there and to really make inclusion possible for all Australians. So if you were to work at Everyday Independence, we all sign up to this. We strive every day to lead and support individuals their families, their communities, and our nation to become global leaders for inclusion. We want to be the best at NDIS therapy delivery services in the world. And I think that's really achievable. Australia is leading the way in disability support. The world is watching how we do it and everyday independents are leading the way in this. So um, yes, we're, we're very, very enthusiastic about what we do. We want to be global leaders for inclusion. How do we do that? We do that by having an incredible model of practice, but actually underpinning that is a social model of disability and underpinning that is our values. So we don't have time to go through this tonight, but if you are interested, please go to our website and look at our values. But everybody in our organisation really does their first principle thinking in terms of what our values are. We are there to change the game. We want to accelerate social change. We want to inspire with belief. And what that means is supporting people with a disability to really believe for too long they've really had to survive and now we have funding and supports in place to help them with, help them to thrive. But with all of these values, the way that we work with people with a disability is exactly the same way that we work with employees. So we also want to inspire with belief in our employees. We want you to understand as a health professional what is truly possible and what can be your contribution to be truly possible in making inclusion a reality for all Australians. Similarly, we champion the person, participants, strengths-based, really believing that they can be whatever it is that they want to be, the same with our employees. Let's look at what you're good at, let's look at your areas for development and let's support you to engage in your everyday work life and your everyday personal life. We are one team with purpose. We are united and you'll see from tonight's model that we wrap supports around the person. So regardless of what your role is at Everyday Independence, you contribute to the outcome for the individual. And this one's still a little bit aspirational, but we want to simplify and go for you as an employee, but for our participants as well, we want to keep things simple so people can get out there and do what it is that they need to do in order to achieve our why. So, our values are deeply at the heart of a social model, but deeply at the heart of the everyday independence culture, and that drives our workplace culture and the ways in which we work together. I included this slide. Um, I think 2022 was a real pivotal point for really starting to bring Australians on board with um, global inclusion. So we've been hearing from people like Dylan Alcott for many, many years, who says that everybody deserves the right to live in an accessible environment and to make independent choices about where they work, how they live and what they do. I think it's the same for employees, but we're seeing people like Gen Senator Jordan Steele. We're seeing um, a lot more um, inclusion in, uh, you know, the things that we watch on TV, um, the way we interact in our communities. So it's really great to see mainstream role models out there supporting all Australians, not just us as healthcare professionals, not just people and families that live with disability, but all Australians to really think differently about disability. But that's really, again, at the core of being a change maker. Our role is to not just go out there and deliver services, but to really bring this sort of values and this talk to life. So I think it's really incredible that that was recognised as Australian of the Year last year. 
And so how do we do that? Uh, we entered the NDIS at the very beginning from trial. We've been curating data, evidence from across the globe, and we've got some amazing thought leaders and researchers and um, implementers in our organisation. And we've developed the Everyday Lead tool, which is the first of its kind, and it's exclusive to Everyday Independence, which is going to be able to deliver quantifiable outcomes to the NDIS. And so this is one of the things where the NDIA and even government is really interested in what Everyday Independence is doing because we're actually going to be able to show them a return on investment, which is at the very core of the NDIS. So this is really, really, really exciting. The other thing, we've recently entered into a partnership with APM. APM is Australia's leading um, disability uh, employment provider. So we can now not only support people to live their best life, but we can support people to enter into meaningful and purposeful work as well. So this is really exciting because for in order to the NDIS to be successful, uh, we do need people having economic and civic outcomes. And I'll tell you a story about that in just a moment. Social model, as I said, curating evidence from across the globe to really deliver person-centred support outcomes. That's at the heart of the training of um, at Everyday Independence. And we have a habit coach program, which is now about two years strong, where families and therapy teams are supported by habit coaches, which probably most like what we would call an allied health assistant. And this is where the person spends time with the family, establishing the skills and routines that they are learning in therapy. So it's a great way of accelerating change for people, but also adding value to a person's plan. So how do we do this? Let me give you a practical example. I worked with a young man called Charlie. He was 18 years of age and he came to me um, for a mini tramp. That, that was the reason that the um, referral was made. And when we were doing the assessment, I said to mum, what's Charlie going to do next year when he finishes school? And mum said to me, oh, I don't know. I think I'll give up work and I'll look after Charlie because Charlie hates day program. And I said to her, oh, are we not going to look at further educational work for Charlie? And she looked at me and she said, Charlie has autism, you know. And she'd been conditioned for 18 years of Charlie's life to perhaps not be able to dream for him, but just to think about how are we going to keep Charlie safe and how are we going to manage Charlie in his adult life. Anyway, we were able to wrap a team around Charlie, OT, physiotherapy, speech pathology, behaviour support practitioners, and Charlie had a love for animals. He even came to the um, therapy session with a dog. And we were able to support over quite a period of time, Charlie to be able to start some volunteer work at his uncle's veterinary practice. Now, fast forward three or four years now, Charlie now works in that veterinary practice 25 hours a week. And his mother has stayed in um, employment and is incredibly satisfied in her role. Charlie has friends, he has a community about around him. I even remember mum telling me she was a little bit annoyed because Charlie would prefer to spend Christmas Day with his friends rather than with her, which is, you know, super normal for someone in their, in their early 20s. So from a humanitarian perspective, how wonderful that Charlie was living a life with purpose and that he was actually, um, you know, and his mother was able to stay in employment and to be able to provide for families. They could still go on family holidays. They could do all of those things that you can't do when you live on a disability support pension. So humanitarianly, Fabulous, okay? But even from an economic financial perspective, in order to make the NDIS work, Charlie's mum stayed in full-time employment for an extra probably 25 years. She was around her early 40s at the time we did the consultation. And Charlie is earning money and he's a taxpayer as well. We also know from the research that their um, health out outcomes are likely to be much greater from both the mental and physical health point of view if people are engaged in their community and employed. So we worked out for this one family alone, the saving to Charlie and us being able to support Charlie to do this is somewhere between four and eight million dollars over the cost of Charlie's life. So how are we going to achieve this? This is how we do this. We've got a model, we've got our lead, we've got our APM partnership, we've got our social model and our habit coach program. There are thousands of Charlies in Australia that we can support. And I think it's so exciting now that if you are born with a disability or you acquire a disability, 
that you can actually now say to somebody, what do you want to be when you grow up, knowing that there is going to be a workforce and the reasonable and necessary supports to enable them to achieve that? So on any given day, it is not wasted on me what a privilege it is to have this job. Okay, let's move forward because I get very excited and I talk for too long about these things. So how do we do it? As I said, that's Charlie, he's one. We now have more than 700 employees in 40 hubs across six states. We're expanding our reach throughout every state in Australia and we are accelerating and improving outcomes with habit coaches because people are getting to practice skills and routines and build their confidence in between their sessions. So we really want to um, build a workforce and continue to build a workforce that's going to have this impact. And, you know, this, this incredible partnership with APM, they're doing the best in employment. We're doing, you know, the, the best um, in delivering outcomes for people with a disability. I think we can really change the national landscape of what it means to be born with or to live with a disability. How do we do this? Lots of different things that you'll see tonight, but it is really exciting that we have so many thought leaders now in our organisation and we have so many people that are able to get the word out there and influence. So that's just a few people on the screen that have been presenting at conferences, um, presenting their research and really starting to spread the word. It's no longer just enough to go and do therapy for people in their homes. You actually need to be able to go out there and deliver outcomes for people that are going to be meaningfully meaningful and change their life, meaning that people can seek employment, meaning that people can have relationships, meaning that people can go to university and fail and it not be considered a fail, but they might need to change course. Enabling people to have dignity of risk. You know, I often think about the teenagers. We've all had those times where we've had, you know, terrible makeup or terrible clothes choices. We often didn't allow those sorts of things for people with a disability. So enabling them and our thought leaders enable us to do this by really encouraging people to say, go out there, swing a bat, have a go, make a mistake, and that's okay. We get up and we go again. And what I love about our leadership at Everyday Independence is we try really hard to drive this home with participants, but we also need to drive it home with our employees. You'll hear tonight that we're actually trying different workforces now and looking at, well, what talent and skills do we have in Australia to enable us to really lead the charge for change? So if you do come and work at Everyday Independence, come and make some mistakes, come and have a go and really discover what's your true potential in exactly the same way that I would love and hope that you'd be able to support people living with a disability to discover their true potential. So I've probably already talked about it, but why would you work in disability or why would you work at Everyday Independence? The research tells us that people want three things when they're looking for a career change, whether that's they're coming out of university or they might be having worked in a different sector for quite some time. So I myself, I worked in um, tertiary hospitals for the first 12 years of my career, and I was always so curious about what happens to these people when they go home? You know, what problems do they encounter? What, what are their outcomes like, which you know, brought me into this industry? So why work in disability? You'll future-proof your career. 30, possibly even $40 billion scheme. As I said, the globe is watching, but if we can get people like Charlie having great outcomes, the National Disability Insurance Scheme will actually add GDP to the Australian money, as Australian economy. It will make Australia money and it will have great humanitarian outcomes. So the both sides of government are really committed to this and there will always be jobs in disability. So come to EI and learn contemporary disability practice and you will future-proof your career. Social models the recognised way forward. Dylan Alcott's talking about it. Senator Jordan Steele, as I said before, Chloe Hayden, all of these people that, you know, are the voices of disability. Um, and certainly that's what the NDIA is looking for. Uh, investment and innovation. There's no greater sector that's being invested in and innovated in. One in five jobs by 2025 will sit in the health and human services sector. So you will never, ever be not only out of work, but, you know, be able to work in an area where you're being paid and you can have a livelihood, but at the same time, you can actually live a life with purpose. I mean, that's just certainly a win-win for many of the change makers we have here at EI. And there's huge um, career growth and earning opportunities because of the 
the the scheme and as as it progresses as i said a 40 billion dollar scheme so there really are you know we um talk about people in our organization that some go into team leaders and operational leadership pathways some become clinical specialists in certain areas others become training and education so there's lots of different things that you can try so as i said the evidence says we want cause community and career cause we've got it in buckets we're going to change the life of people in australia community you'll hear about hub life later on tonight great communities and you can accelerate your career here as well so this is whether you're a participant or whether you're an employee we really have three phases that people work through we'll support you to believe in yourself or support participants to believe in themselves then push at your edges your comfort zone expand your boundaries and then make a breakthrough that's the way we work with people with a disability um, you'll see tonight inspire with belief is on some people's backgrounds as a core value we need to inspire participants with belief to make their break breakthrough same with our employees let's make your breakthrough as well we have and there's too much information in this next few slides it's really just to demonstrate to you that the clinical career pathways at everyday independence are well thought out and people tend to work through them in a sequential order however they can actually jump between clinical pathways and transfer their knowledge as well so you're going to hear tonight specifically from disability practitioners, you're going to hear from a disability specific practice as well, and you're going to hear from positive behaviour support. But there are other career pathways here at Everyday Independence as well. And as I said, if we go to the next slide, busy, busy slide, but please, it's just, and this is constantly changing due to the feedback from employees, really tangible career pathways, because people always tell us, I know what I want to do, but I need the steps to get there. So we've been able to step out what the career pathways look like for people. Um, and that's a real collaborative process about how we do that. And you'll hopefully see that a little bit more in action tonight. So here's Morgan. Morgan is one of our team leaders in our Western um, team. I actually think she's Aeon's team leader who you'll be hearing from tonight, or at least they're in the, in the same hub. And this is just an example of one individual's career pathway, going from occupational therapist, doing some key worker training as well, then becoming a therapy mentor and a team leader. But let's look at Morgan as if she was also a participant or a service user of the NDIS. That person will have a person-centred individualised plan. So will any other employee at Everyday Independence. So really choosing from a menu or a huge variety of options about what your career could look like. We know that if people are working in an area that they are passionate about, they drive super strong outcomes for people living with a disability. So that that's that's at the heart of it. If we can get people passionate, get people really wanting to change, you know, be change makers in their area of practice, we know we're going to drive great outcomes for Australia. Everyday supports, again, really detailed slide. Um, and I don't want to labour on this too much. But again, the employee or the learner is at the centre. And these supports are there to build your skills and confidence and really curate and work out what's best for you and how do we unlock your passion. So we have interdisciplinary teams, we have hub life, we have discipline specific mentoring. So OTs mentoring OTs, speeches mentoring speeches. But then we also have other mentoring sessions that are more, more generic in their, in their um, uh, approach as well. We have everyday therapy mentoring, which is actually digital mentoring, where you can actually drop in digitally every day and meet with a senior clinician and get them to help you with your mentoring. So you mightn't have time to wait until your next mentoring session because you're going out and seeing that participant that afternoon. We have communities of practice where people get together and discuss research scenarios. Um, they're really, really fun. We have career coaching. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that, again, have been curated based on evidence, feedback, and about 10 years of working in social model to really, if we don't get the training right, we can't bring the model to life. So this is really at the very heart of what we do. So you will learn from industry leading clinicians. Okay, so this is the part of the evening that I really love. You get to speak to people that are living and breathing 
being an everyday change maker. Tonight we have Ivane Greblo and she's a positive behaviour support practitioner and advanced therapy mentor. She's going to be speaking with us first and then later on I'll introduce you to Ayan and Sara and they're going to talk to us about their role as an occupational therapist and a disability practitioner and you know how they've gone on that journey as well. So Ivane, we're actually going to start with you this evening if that's if that's all right. Um, Ivane has Excellent. And I will say I'm going to big you up here a little bit because we are very grateful for your talent. You do have a long work history as a registered nurse in an acute and community settings. And you've spent more than 10 years, I think, in clinical education. So big win when you chose to come across to come across to EI. So I'm going to ask you some questions this evening and um, feel free to, you know, uh, answer them but if there's anything else that people want to ask as well please pop your questions in the chat and we can get to those as well. So Ivani question one what appealed to you most about working as a positive behaviour support practitioner at EI and how were you supported to make a career or make the move I should say from your career in nursing transitioning into your role at EI? Oh, hi Ingrid thanks for that. Um, look, I really wanted to make uh, a, a bigger impact, I suppose, um, and uh, support change in a more kind of effective and supportive way for people that we support. Um, and, and a bit like yourself, Ingrid, you know, I, I've worked um, in the public health system for quite some time, um, dabbled in a little bit of private, but it, it's always, you know, yeah, that sort of curiosity, being curious about what happens when they do do depart and um, head on back into the community. Um, I actually found my skills and knowledge were really easily transferable too. Coming from years of working in clinical nursing and education and training, it just felt really quite natural for me. Um, EOI really promoted those opportunities for me as a mental health nurse as well. So essentially, uh, I've actually really started to specialise uh, working with you know, what, what is really dual disability um, and working with reducing restrictive practice um, that can occur with people who experience those sort of challenging behaviours, um, you know, living with disability or psychosocial disability. Um, and, you know, I think uh, through the implementation of the, the PBS model, um, I've had that real privilege of seeing some you know, incredible positive change in the people that we support. Um, and yeah, it's it's um, it's even just the smallest achievement is just so great to see. I vividly recall my first <laughs> my first start at EI, and it was a bit of a transition. It was um, you know, like starting any new job can feel a bit overwhelming, but. I felt very safe, very valued and reassured. Um, and, and, and I think being val feeling valued was really important. It, it's, a, it's a value of your skills and the knowledge that you're bringing into the role. Um, but most importantly too, I think being supported in how to actually direct that. Um, and it's not just about what, what was, you know, going to be a positive thing for myself. It, it was actually about what was positive for the people that we care for. So yeah. it felt like a win-win for myself and, and EI, and I haven't looked back since. Yeah. I often say that as well. I think I even said at the beginning of the presentation, the fact that you can go out and do this job and, you know, have a livelihood and provide for your own family is is, is quite amazing, isn't it? It is. It mm. is. Mm. So let's jump to what does positive behaviour support look like at EI in the social model? And how are you driving positive change for both individuals um, in our community? Oh, wow. How do I wrap that up in <laughs> a tight little bundle? Um, so, look, at P PBS is a real opportunity to ch actually change that sort of trajectory for a person um, and in a way that's really kind of truly person-centred. And it actually has a really strong focus of placing that choice and control with the person. Um, and it's quite, you know, um, holistic in the sense that it it looks at the person's whole context and all the environments that they frequent, and, you know, not just one environment that that they're sitting within. And it builds on meaningful connections. I think that's the thing that really stood out for me. Um, 
and I and I strongly feel that that actually creates that uh, really lovely sense of belonging, which is what every human being wants. Um, I've got a story to share. Um, oh, I love a story. I, you know, I love a story. <laughs> if that's okay, <laughs> and it, it kind of really wraps all that up nicely. Um, and and I've been supporting this sixty seven year old participant for the last two years. Uh, I think at one stage we tried to hand over to another PBS, but um, I ended up sort of uh, taking him back on and um, just to provide that consistency because that's something that's really we really value and find important at um, AI as well. So this participant was actually prescribed antipsychotic medication and he was put on it for quite a number of years. We're talking over several years. And on investigation, this is not an uncommon scenario for many of us who, who work in this in the healthcare industry and um, in this, particularly in this field, you know, of disability. We we often don't know why these medications are prescribed. Um, so it, it was quite a familiar scenario for me. Um, it didn't feel right though. Um, but most importantly, it didn't feel right for him. He just didn't feel like he was being heard. Um, we kind of, I think he fell into that sort of pattern of just trusting that, you know, the experts knew best <laughs> and, and ended up letting it go. So he was on this medication for an undiagnosed condition for quite, quite some time. And, and that antipsychotic medication had some really horrific side effects for him. Uh, so not just the sedation, but it really blunted his personality you know the the core of the core of who he was um, couldn't shine. I suppose is a good way of putting it. Um, so working with him and his supports and family, um, PBS model was able to reduce that restrictive practice. We encouraged that choice and control, and he was able to make uh, you know a, an informed decision about that medication and with the support of his family as well. And they decided to come off the medication. Um, and oh gosh, I don't we, we really seriously haven't looked back since. Um, so together we were able to formulate a really safe plan that reduced the medication over a gradual period of time. So it sort of, you know, was um, safe in the sense that it didn't create a lot of anxiety and it wasn't a swift change. It was very carefully thought, thought through. Um, and uh, we ended up reducing it, uh, which meant that not only has he had an improved quality of life, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but we also didn't need to report on that formally because it was a restrictive practice that was actually reduced before it went through to um, that, that reportable process. Um, but absolutely, most importantly, um, he is so well engaged in meaningful activity today. And most um, importantly, it's allowed him to grow and develop some really positive relationships and connections with um, his friends and family. Um, and that's that's through his day program and, and just, you know, with the people that he lives with. Um, you know, I think PBS can truly be an integral part of the overall healthcare system and that this story shows how PBS can actually work to close that gap. You know, the collaborative approach with um, healthcare professionals, medical professionals, enabled this um, incredible change for this person who, who just has this really improved overall quality of life. Um, and, and we were able to sort of, you know, yeah, close that gap and support him in navigating, you know, what was required because um, it can often be that really overwhelming process uh, for anyone, let alone someone living with disability. Thank you. I think it's just, it's so amazing when you can see how an intervention like that can really significantly change someone's life and, as you said, you know, change their relationships and the people that they interact with. Now, I am going to combine question three and question four for you, Ivani, because... Okay. Yep. I know that your career has evolved quite significantly since joining AI, so I do want to hear a little bit about that. But you speak about the 67-year-old gentleman, and I know that you're supporting a lot of other practitioners at um, AI to also um, 
you know, develop their careers as positive behaviour support practitioners. So, look, I'm interested to hear from you. How's your career evolved? But also, what else is in place to support other PBS practitioners' careers to evolve, to evolve as well? Sure. Yep. Um, oh my gosh, it's been an incredible ride. <laughs> yep. It's, it seriously has. Um, and uh, yeah, and and again, I just feel such a, a privilege to be to be working in this area and working with the people that I do work with, both you know um, other practitioners and and participants and family supports. You know, when I joined DI, I actually began my career as a proficient PBS practitioner because of what I was bringing in um, to the role. But, um, you know, with my previous experience uh, that was acknowledged pretty soon, I was supported into an actual uh, like a therapy mentor position. Um, and today, uh, two and a bit years later, um, I'm sitting in the role as an advanced therapy mentor um, and hold that advanced level of PBS registration. So it's um, it's been a, an amazing um, you know journey for me, um, but also one that's been really quite supportive and, and has felt quite natural. The role that I'm sitting in is really it's regional and it offer, offers uh, travel as well, and it enables me to bring that support. Uh, to the ground um, uh, for other PBS practitioners. Uh, the level of support provided um, actually varies according to the level of experience each, each practitioner holds. So it's very tailored uh, to, to suit the practitioners that, that I work with. Um, you know, the development in my career was nurtured from the start and, and I guess I want to be able to give that opportunity to others. I want to set others up for success in their career at EI as well. Um, and, and and you mentioned earlier, Ingrid, around the GROW plans. And, and I think that was really something very essential for, for me. And I can certainly see the value of that for the practitioners that, that I support in my current role. Um, and the GROW plan gives not only, you know, some direction, for myself, but it actually gives that sort of overall direction for my team leader, but also, um, you know, as an advanced um, advanced therapy mentor and practitioner, it's it's also, you know, kind of puts everyone on that same page with the area lead and state lead who I tend to work a bit closely with now as well. Um, so understanding the direction of where I want to head, um, you know, my achievements and certain competencies also that need to be met. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, and I think it, yeah, it creates just this really great um, um, connection within the hub uh, that is really strength based yeah, um, within within the culture. Yep. Yeah. And as you said, right. safe. Yes. Yeah, so, so I want to ask you yeah. that question. Speaking of, have you made yeah. any mistakes, Ivani, or? Do you well, let people I make mistakes? Say, yeah, <laughs> I really resonated with what you said earlier um, because, yeah, I have. And, and you know, I don't think that, I think that that's where, and most of us know that's where we do majority of our learning is through those challenging moments. And, um, but most importantly, as I said, it is safe. It's safe to be able to try new things. And, and if it doesn't go according to plan, that that's okay. Um, you know, we 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 use those as learning opportunities, um, and and that was something that I really resonated with me when I well actually throughout my whole journey, you know, up yep. to today really, um, and you don't get that everywhere. No, so no. I, I think that's really of, unique. It's one of the things we are very proud of is that dignity of risk and and the. Yep the learning that can happen. Ivani, thank you so much. Um, well, you and I could talk for months on, on this topic. <laughs> I'm really grateful. Please hang around because we may have some questions later on in the presentation and bring you back into it as well. But we are going to move across to Ayan. Ayan joined, um, o Ayan's at OT and she works in our Derrimut Hub in Western Melbourne. Ayan joined us at the beginning of 2021. So for everybody, that's halfway through the pandemic um, as a new graduate therapist as part of our Everyday Flying Start graduate program. And so she's been with us now for just over two years and um, is recently moved into the role of therapy mentor. So, you know, really an outstanding career trajectory to date. So Ayan, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions tonight, just like I have Ivani. Are you able to tell us about your career journey since joining EI? 
and the different things that you've been able to experience in what is really, you know, according to a, a career, a relatively short space of time. Well, thanks, Ingrid. Um, yeah, it has been a really quick two years at Everyday Independence. I started as a new graduate OT through our Everyday Flying Start program. And after a couple of months, I wanted to jump into running some of our group programs and be one of our group therapists running the Building Connections program, which was a lovely experience and helped me grow. I then moved into the assistive technology and home modification space. Um, and I was really excited to do that, which was great. And I recently moved on to being one of the therapy mentors for the Western region. Fantastic. So that's so lovely when we hear that somebody moves into a therapy mentor role because they've obviously achieved a significant level of competency to be training training others. So Ayan, can you tell me a little bit more about your role as a therapy mentor? How does it work? What do you enjoy about being a mentor? And you know, more broadly, how are you supporting others to create positive change for participants and themselves? Well, as a therapy mentor, I get to support other team members grow in their clinical skills, but also grow their confidence the same way my mentors got to help me. It's yep. always mentee led. So the way therapy mentor runs for each of my mentee is completely different because it goes off of what their preferences are and how they learn best. So yep. it could either be problem solving what their caseload look like or going out to run sessions together or trying some new assessments or having those discussions around difficult conversations with families. So it's quite varied in how we support each other. Fantastic. And do you enjoy it? Oh, I love it. It's, it's honestly made my work-life balance a lot better because <laughs> I've always liked helping people. Yeah, fantastic. That's awesome. So everyday independence based based on that is, you know, offers lots of learning and development opportunities for practitioners, regardless of the pathway that you pursue. And you would have seen that from the previous slide with all of those circles that sat around the employee. Um, so you've pursued two pathways. So, you know, a multiple pathway. What are the learning and development supports for you that you found most beneficial in in um really pursuing your career journey but also you're going down a dual pathway as well well for me I'd have to say everyday therapy mentoring has been the most beneficial to my growth at EI mm -hmm. um, as you said before it's a drop-in mentoring service so we can kind of access at any time of the day every day of the week with different varied therapists with varied experiences so it's quite helpful running a dual pathway as my one-to-one -one mentor isn't experienced in the AT space but is really experienced as a core OT but jumping onto everyday therapy mentoring I can get a clinician who's very experienced in AT to help me. Um, for me it's been a lifesaver. I am a major overthinker so I like to get answers straight away so if I'm stressed out I know I can jump in and get that support straight away. Um, if I have an example, I went through a really difficult conversation with a participant's family the other day, which left mm -hmm. me quite saddened and a little bit unsure of what to do next, as it was something yeah. I haven't ever experienced previously. But I just went back to my car and jumped on TM and I had a therapist sitting there who helped me debrief and think of what to do next and just kind of reassured me that I knew what to do. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's been the best part of VI. Um, I'd say the second thing to help my growth in EI is um, our therapy team and our overall hub life. I don't think I would have enjoyed working in a, you know, sometimes stressful environment. If I didn't have a team, I could go back to fall on, have listening ears, have fun with, and just remind me that, you know, we love our role and, you know, we enjoy working together. So, yeah, I'd say those yeah. two helped me. Yeah, fantastic. I think you're right. The hub life is just such the most wonderful protective factor for health and well-being when we do a role that, you know, absolutely at times can be quite heavy. 
and um, to be able to have the camaraderie of your team and to work in an interdisciplinary team where it's very rare that there isn't somebody else or multiple people in the organisation that don't know your participant um, as well and that you can work together. And um, yeah, they do have fun social activities. I got invited to, um, what's it called? Paint and Sip today. Um, so we're going along and painting and having a wine on a Friday night so that that the ability to build social connection, we talk about it with our participants all the time, but we also do it in the workplace as well, because as I said, there's multiple health and wellbeing protective factors that we need to put in place if we are going to achieve on this why. We want people working in this um, organisation for decades, or at least in the industry for decades, to deliver these great outcomes to the NDIS, and we need to look after each other and ourselves in order to do that. So, Ayan, thank you. Thank you so much. So I know that you were looking at graduate opportunities two years ago and it was important for you to have flexibility and control of your workload and your work-life balance. So what does that look like for you and how have you managed to maintain that? And again, despite pursuing two sort of career pathways at the same time. Um, well, having a busy life and coming from a really big family with a lot of responsibilities, flexibility has always been the key criteria for me for any role. And here at Everyday Independence, you know, we get that choice and we've got that flexible approach to design work life to be the way that works best for us. I get to have, you know, full control over my calendar and organise it in a way that fits my lifestyle and, you know, my energy levels as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm always supported by my team leader to always kind of stick to that boundary and understand what my perfect week looks like. And, you know, I like to work best in the afternoons and that's where all my thinking sits. So I schedule all my sessions with participants in the afternoon. So I'm giving them my best selves, but I know I'm really good with typing, so I do all my reports in the morning and I can do that because it fits with the way I want it. But, you know, flexibility at Everyday Independence also means I get a level of control over my caseload um, and I get to design my caseload to suit my clinical interests. So I like assistive technology and home mods, so half my caseload revolves around participants in that area. Um, I like doing therapy mentors, so some of my time is mentoring other therapists and, you know, I love supporting teenagers as well. So a large portion of my caseload gets to be the teenagers. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I love, I love listening to that because the self-awareness that you are just exuding about what works best for you so you can then go out and just deliver your best self is just you know, that's really at the heart of, of, of person-centred practice about, you know, really bringing all stakeholders um, to, to be their best self. So that's just awesome. So I'm sorry, I do need to ask a very stock standard basic question. What do the next two to five years look like for you? I mean, you've had a stellar start to your career. I hope in the next two to five years I can continue to grow in these areas and I hope to be the best OT I can be for my participants and I hope that one day I'll be confident in the assistive technology and home mod space and maybe even mentor in that space. Yeah. But my overall end goal has always kind of been to make a big difference and support as many people as possible, whether it is by participants or team members. So I kind of hope I can go through the motions and one day be a part of the learning and development team where I can kind of make yeah. a change at a bigger organisational level and, you know, in turn support an even greater caseload. Yeah, certainly. And, and I'd certainly describe you as a multiplier. So, you know, I think about that grad year, you probably had 30 to 40 people on your on your caseload. And my understanding is you have about seven mentees now. So seven mentees, you know, let's keep it, let's say 30 people on a caseload. You're now impacting the lives of over 200 participants and their families. So that, that ability for you to multiply if you're trained well, you can execute well and you can support others um, is, is quite incredible. So yes, you did tell me that you really want to contribute and look at what you've achieved in two years. So congratulations. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to our third panellist, everybody, and this is Sarah. Sarah actually joined Everyday Independence fa fairly recently, and we were super excited about her joining us as well in our Newcastle hub. Sarah is a social worker, 
and has previously worked as a social worker in the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. Sarah, please correct me if I'm not correct there. And this is a more recent addition to the Everyday Independence team about um, welcoming social workers, but also other disciplines that can join us as a disability practitioner. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the disability practitioner before um, I welcome Sarah to speak to us. But the disability practitioner is a new role. It's very unique to everyday independence. And we introduced it to EI as a pilot last year, and we rolled it out in six of our hubs initially. Disability practitioner roles are really um, suitable for all allied health professionals and nurses. So we've got people um, in social work, developmental education, uh, nursing backgrounds. We also have some of our other allied health professionals, so some physios, some OTs, some speeches. But um, certainly our social workers have been doing an incredible job because they are so good at bringing that whole social model coaching context context together. But if you love this area, there are lots of professions that can really um, lend themselves quite beautifully to a disability practitioner. So our short term aim is to have at least one, perhaps two disability practitioners at all of our hubs. And their role is to support individuals and families to get access to support faster. And they play a critical role in helping us to reduce our wait lists, to onboard new participants, they use our lead tool that I talked about, which is, you know, amazing for the participant as an individual, but is, you know, really advancing the research knowledge because we're able to look at the data across a variety of, of communities. And then they also curate the right blend of supports or wrap the therapy team around individuals to get the best outcome for their, um, for their goals. So at no mean feat, quite a big role, but a really well-designed role um, because of the, the um, pilot. And um, Sarah, is Sarah, I should say, is one of the first that has been doing this role for us. So it's been such an exciting journey to look at how we add this to our NDIS workforce. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to start with the first question that because this is a new role and it's certainly not well understood outside of EI, it is at EI, inside EI now, how would you describe a typical day of being a disability practitioner? Yeah, well, thanks for having me tonight, Ingrid. Um, so, a typical day for a disability practitioner looks a little bit like doing lots of face-to-face -face appointments with um, participants conducting that social model initial assessment exclusive to EI, like you were just talking about, our lead tool. Um, other, other than initial assessments, um, I work with other disciplines to advocate for the goals of the participant in therapy planning to mm -hmm. ensure that therapeutic interventions are aligned with the participants' wants and needs. Um, I also conduct other assessments. So um, we have assessments here at EI like uh, daily living support needs assessments, which really kind of advocate and identify for participants needing additional NDIS funding. Um, some other things that I do is liaise with families or stakeholders. Um, I also deliver face-to-face -face therapy with participants in the NDI in the social work scope. Um, but I really just enjoy every aspect of my role as each participant uh, requires a unique and individual level of support from someone in the disability practitioner space. Yeah, fantastic. And you, you're going to be too humble to perhaps share this, but what our team members are telling us about disability practitioners, um, but Sarah and social workers uh, in particular is the support that they provide to our teams in terms of the in terms of the cohesion or you know being able to discuss a participant concern that you know is often you know they're often in quite socially complex situations so to have an experienced social worker or developmental educator or or nurse just to be able to discuss some of those non therapeutic things too sometimes that are getting in the way so yeah the Newcastle team just speaks so highly of 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 the way you conduct yourself as a team member, Sarah, and the support you're able to provide in your role. So I have to say that because she's not going to say that about herself, <laughs> but it's, it's certainly um, evidencing itself across our organisation about the role that the disability practitioner plays in not just supporting participants and families, but the whole team. But you have a background in social work. I'm interested to know what was the appeal of this role and also, and please be honest, 
has it lived up to the expectation? Yeah, um, uh, like you mentioned before, I um, I worked for a number of years in the child protection space as a social worker before I came to this role. Um, but I always wanted to find a role in the disability sector where I could practice social work without my skills kind of being pigeonholed by a job description. So when I saw the disability practitioner role advertised, I jumped for it um, because everyday independents kind of have identified a gap in the sector and are really changing the game by trialing social workers or developmental educators or mental health nurses um, in kind of this social model and our person-centred approach to therapy and supporting individuals meeting their goals. Um, so being able to kind of work for a company um, and being a disability practitioner enables me to utilise a full breadth of my skills um, and, you know, approach working with participants in a holistic way. Um, I'm able to use my knowledge and theories to hone my skills as a practitioner, which I really find um, really quite beneficial for the longevity of my future career as well. Um, so the disability practitioner role not only kind of allows me to practice social work, but it allows me to learn from everyday independences, other allied health professionals who are here with us um, through that social model lens that doesn't necessarily exist anywhere else. Fantastic. I, I do remember in the early interviews with social workers and describing the role, they were like, yes, this is what we've trained for. And I learned so much from those interviews because, you know, at the heart of what you do is a social model. As some of us as allied health professionals had to learn social model. And the other thing that you do at the heart of what you do is you coach and that really is the vehicle in which we work with participants and families and our employees at EI. So it's been it's been a little bit of why did it take us so long to um, really introduce social workers into our um, organisation? And as I said, there will be other people perhaps here tonight that are from nursing backgrounds, developmental education backgrounds or other like backgrounds, which are in the NDIS pricing guide, which is how we you know, are able to curate our workforce. Please reach out if you do think that, you know, I don't have a social work background, but this could be a role that I'm interested in. It is it is um, something that, um, you know, people have a lot of transferable skills in. So how, Sarah, are EI offering a unique employment experience for social workers in this role? Um, well, for me personally, I believe that everyday independents are truly ahead of the game in the disability sector. Um, due to the social model and our person-centred approaches and strength-based approaches to therapy and supporting individuals to meet their goals. Um, so being able to work for a company uh, who practice through a social model lens in a medical model industry is so important um, to me as a social worker and my values and my beliefs as a professional. Um, as I'm able to kind of apply my professional principles without having to defend the importance of evidence-based approaches to, to therapy. Um, but everyday independence and the role of the disability practitioner, even though it's still in its infancy um, within the company and being understood by other social workers in the community or the NDIS, um, still doesn't necessarily deter me away from the role. It kind of brings me in a little bit more um, because it makes me so honoured to be able to uh, practice this brand new opportunity um, that's not being done anywhere else um, and practice social work in a new space and empower people living with disabilities while also honing my own skills. Um, that are transferable to multiple different aspects of my professional practice. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, Sarah, I'm going to demonstrate how we pivot and we simplify and go here. I'm going to replace your last question actually with some questions that are in the chat. So please take yeah. your time. But um, one of the first ones comes in and it's a social worker, but I mainly have a mental health background. Would this background be 
transferable to working in the disability sector at EI? Um, absolutely. You know, they every single participant that we come across at Everyday Independence and in the NDIS space is so different and unique and what their goals are and what their needs are are so varying and across the board. So, of course, um, you know, there's a lot of participants that I'm currently working with in my single discipline social work approach to therapy um, who are psychosocial uh, participants of the NDIS. So they really do uh, experience and live with a, a vast range of different uh, different things that impact upon them. So, you know, participants of the NDIS who are struggling with social welfare or with child protection or um, you know, just those little little other things that really exemplify their vulnerability of also being an NDIS participant. So, um, of course, like in in social work, and as Ingrid kind of highlighted before, with working for everyday independence, it's a breath of fresh air because there is we all are using the social model lens, and that as a social worker, that's kind of our bread and butter. So. You know, it's um, you just can it, take that approach as you will. Yeah, and and you were probably concentrating on the question when I asked you, but Ivani and um, was fiercely nodding as was Aon because you know we've got people from employees from such different backgrounds in our team, and you possibly could be a you could be a disability support practitioner, but it also probably lends itself to positive behaviour support as well. It may even lend itself to key worker, which is another clinical careers event that we're running um, later on um, in the second half. I think it's June or July. I'll get those dates for you. So it's about the right fit people with the right skills that really want to make make a difference. So absolutely. And Sarah, this is probably something that's emerging because it's a very, very new role. But somebody here has firstly congratulated you for giving a lot of insight into the role, but asking is the role appropriate for new graduates? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I personally don't really know how to answer that question, to be honest, yeah. um, because we are still really in its infancy. We're still trying to figure out what the disability practitioner um, pathway looks like at the moment. Um, yeah. So I might have to hand that back to you, Ingrid, um, because, yeah. yeah, even though there might be uh, pathways in the future, but right now I've, I'm – Honestly, yeah. not too sure. <laughs> no, and I think it's I think it's a great answer. I think overall I'm not too sure. But the 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 thing is, firstly, Nicola, we'd want to speak to you. Um, if that's something that's of interest to you. We've certainly, you know, for PBS now, we can actually have new graduates come in because we've built the infrastructure to support new graduates. So we need to build an infrastructure to support the graduates. And we suspect with this program accelerating so quickly that that's going to happen quite quickly. We also have a habit coach program, which I don't have time to delve into tonight, but please look it up on our website or on our YouTube channel. Habit coach program is the best precursor for people that are doing their undergraduate or perhaps some postgraduate studies. That's how they can join our organisation and learn everything about the EI way as well. So that's something else if there are graduates here tonight or people that are going to be graduating sometime in the next couple of years, Habit Coach Program is a great, great pathway um, to do while you're still um, doing uni. We've got a number of questions coming through the chat. I might ask Cherie or Esther to moderate them because we are at 7.02. Guys, we are going to run until about 7.15 tonight. I didn't want to stop the conversation. It's the panellists have done such a incredible job so we will come back to your come back to your questions but we'll just flip through the presentation to the end for the people that can't stay on for very long I am going to race through this next bit it's all there on our website it's a little tiny bit more sales pitch these next two or three slides but I want you to know that if you do join Everyday Independence, there are everyday perks. As I said, if we can have happy, healthy, mentally robust practitioners that have that cause, community, career, and they feel a sense of being, belonging and becoming, you will grow, you will be satisfied and you'll be able to deliver great outcomes. So you'll hear 
and you've heard all tonight, there's lots of flexibility in the role. We've got vibrant have lives, but there's a whole bunch of things. Please look on our website. I won't take you through them tonight, but there are programs which are pretty stock standard that you'll see at most organisations. And then there's programs that we think are real value adds and quite unique to everyday independence. I think our career coaching program is a great example of that. You've heard about grow plans um, tonight. Let's jump ahead, Cherie. We also have a remuneration strategy. Um, we heard very um, strongly from um, many of our employees that different people value different things in the workplace. And often it's not just them as an individual, what they value, but also value different things at different stages of life. So where you are, whether you can spend some more time in your in your learning and growing and development, or whether you you know your focus is actually saving a house deposit or you know, whether your focus might be doing leadership training, we actually have a remuneration strategy that we, again, tailor to the individual. So we would speak with you about that either before you applied, when you applied, or when you're employed at Everyday Independence. But I think what I'm trying to say to this is we truly appreciate cost of living is really going up. For some people, this is a really important point. There is a capacity to stack extra dollars onto your salary if you work at Everyday Independence, which makes us really competitive in the market so we can get the best talent as well. And then we've got everyday wellbeing and inclusion. So we're all about inclusion as we started with, with our why, but a number of wellbeing activities, they really go hand in hand with um, uh, hub life activities as well, but also broadening our knowledge. So, you know, learning more about, I recently um, learned more about the, the um, Ramadan and what that actually looks like and feels like, which I, I didn't have a huge amount of knowledge about, and we were able to do that together as an organisation. But there's lots of other things about your physical health, your mental health, financial awareness, and a whole bunch of things that you can tap into if you want to and when you want to. Hub Life, we've talked about that um, a little bit. Just really cool, fun, loving people that have a shared purpose, that want to support each other so we can go out there and do a really great job. Um, Hub Life is, I think I'm the only person at Everyday Independence that's not that into dogs. Gosh, everybody loves a dog and the dogs come into the hubs often on Fridays as well. Um, I'm a little bit allergic, so that's why I'm a little bit scared. But, uh, you know, again, person-centred approach, the hub, the people in the hub decide what activities it is that um, they like to do. There is one non-negotiable, and that is a Wednesday. Wednesdays are our day where everybody attends the hub. We have team meeting, we have learning, we have social activities um, and connection and things like that. So everybody, if you work at Everyday Independence, works on Wednesday. It's a fabulous anchor day and it really has been a great protective strategy for cohesion and well-being within our teams. So here's the join our team page. Cherie has joined us tonight. In fact, she's been managing the slides for me tonight. Cherie, thank you so much. Um, Cherie's one of my favourite people at Everyday Independence, but she also heads up our talent acquisition team and is incredible. So there's a number of ways that you can contact Cherie and her team. Um, there's phone, there's the careers email, jump online. As I said, we've also got a YouTube channel. Um, but also, if you're not quite ready, it's really good to come along to some of our other careers events. And we've put those in the chat for you tonight um, because you'll be able to, um, you can just log into those and, and register for those events as well. I really think the one in May is going to be super exciting. It's all about learning and development and our le clinical learning and development lead, Maddie Jeffrey, is joining us for, for that event. And um, we've also got another clinical careers event um, that's happening on July the 18th. So again, if you want to click on those and come along and learn a little bit more, you're very, very welcome. And I promise you, I'll change up the spiel so you're not um, hearing the same information information repeated. So Cherie, maybe just say hi so people can see you on the screen in case you're not on their screen. Um, Everybody, great to see so many faces. Ingrid, I was just going to quickly say too for the people on the call who are asking asking the question, are my skills appropriate for this role or is it appropriate for a graduate role? We've got the um, careers inbox email address there. So I'd love for you to send through your resume and we can have a look and start to have those conversations with you about 
what might be the best fit for you, whether it's PBS, whether it's disability practitioner, whether it's key worker. Uh, I'd really encourage those people who have asked the question already um, to send through their information to the careers inbox and um, either myself or one of the team will get back in touch with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and if you get it a little bit wrong, We've had people that have come in and seen something else that's really sparked their interest and they've yeah. changed. So, you know, like Aeon tonight, she's actually on two clinical pathways at the moment because she's, um, you know, wants that that broad training and knowledge. And then we have people that change as well. So, yeah, definitely jump in. We've got some great questions, which we'll definitely come back to. Um, we will just jump to the next slide. I'm going to just spend five minutes because we actually did have a significant amount of graduates register for this evening. So going to give you a very high level taster about what our Everyday Flying Start graduate program looks like. For you, if you're not a graduate and you wanna hang around and hear the questions, please stay on. Honestly, I'll give this three minutes and then we'll move, we'll move back. We're fitting a, quite a bit in this evening. So Everyday Flying Start graduate program, um, it starts every month of the year. You join the graduate program, which is a rolling program. Cherie, let's jump forward to the next slide. And um, it's your foundational year, it's year one. We really encourage people though to often do their second year um, as well because that's where the magic really starts to happen where you can embed a lot of this learning that you have. So it is a permanent role, but the actual graduate program's 12 month tailored program. We have launched it um, nearly nine years ago now. We improve it every year on the year. And you can really hone your craft as an OT, speech and, and physio. But as I said, we're adding now social workers, um, PBS practitioners. So there are more opportunities for graduates of other disciplines getting through. So please use that careers email to see. The, the way that we do that is we make sure, we've got plenty of participants, long wait lists, but we've got to make sure we've got the right supports in the right place for our graduates. So that's how we often determine whether we've got a vacancy or not. The sooner we know about you, the longer we've got to get those supports in place. But it's a diverse caseload, it's an interdisciplinary team, and there's yeah, lots of great things that happen in that program. If we look at the next slide, it's really about building your confidence and skills. And this is really just to demonstrate that it is mapped out over the 12 months about how you build on your skills, build on your skills, build on your skills. You will become a social model practitioner. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's actually about building a future fit workforce. We're training for the next two decades. Okay, so don't go, um, just be really, do your due diligence over where and how you're going to train. Don't go and train in the old, the old practice, train in contemporary evidence-based practice. And for disability, not, not if you're going to work in a hospital, but for disability, that is social model, okay? Social model interdisciplinary practice. And then try and just do a little bit of study about, well, what is that? Because some people say they're doing social model, but they're not really doing social model. They're just doing perhaps multidisciplinary person-centred practice. And they're very, very different, okay? So that's what we'll do. We'll build your skills and confidence. And I mentioned our Habit Coach program. I'm so proud of this program. I encourage you to go. On. I think our um, YouTube clip probably showcases this brilliantly. But we do have a number of people that are training um, in a number of different fields. And they can come and work either casually or on a per permanent part-time basis and actually work with people in their families to practice what they're learning in therapy and to really embed them in their daily routines and skills. So that's another way that many people do enter our, our workforce. I'll just get whoever it is to pop themselves on mute. Um, I think it might be Denise. That one's flashing up on my screen. So Denise, if you could just pop yourself on mute. Um, that's awesome, thank you. Um, so that's our habit coach program. So I told, I, that was even less than three minutes. That's the first time I've met a, a time deadline. I'm very, very, feeling very smug there. So um, yes, any interest, as I said, it's not necessarily, it might be you're just starting to think about it, jump on, have a chat to Cherie, or again, you can do it via email if you're not yet ready to have, have a chat as well.